um, I'm into this uh, bleeding edge technology consulting. And, uh, well, whatever it is, it's, uh, in Germany it's typically um, everything which is not enterprise Java is bleeding edge. So I'm trying to concentrate on this. And uh, I'm working in projects with software like React and Neo4j and um, things like that. So I'm also writing books, and it's a hobby because it doesn't really pay off financially to write books. They all are in German. The current one on the market is Erling OTP, the German book. Is there a German speaker around? You're a German speaker? You're, you're a German speaker? Yeah. So we have two German speakers. Seriously. Um, hey, by the end of the presentation, I want to get rid of this copy. So uh, I'll probably ask a very technical question, and probably in German, just to check if you really can speak German. <laughs> Uh, basically, it's 80% Erling, so uh, everybody can manage to read this book. And, um, yeah, so this is the story behind this book. And I'm, currently, I'm writing a book which is related to, uh, to the topic of this talk, but it's a little bit different. It's called Big Data for IT Decision Makers. It's uh, one level about the technology. And for, for people who are barely... Uh, rarely touching the keyboard, but still make IT relevant decisions. Um, and it's on big data. So this is also the topic of this talk. So here's the, here's the short story. This is a book, it's uh, that thick. For those of you who did read it, probably you cannot read it. It's uh, Tulsa, it's uh, War and Peace. I think it's called War and Peace in English. So the short story is uh, I'm sitting at a conference. Well, actually, accidentally, I, I stumbled into this conference. It's uh, in an industrial IT conference in Germany. And the guy from the company called Otensity is um, talking about his solution, their solution. They're selling it on two big customers, for, on two big customers with three letters in, in the name, two letters probably. and. They all have like Twitter teams. They are running Twitter teams just to check if people are bashing around about their products. So when, everybody, when anybody on social media somewhere, on Facebook, on Twitter, just says, hey, iPhone is shit, so somebody has to react. And this is this Twitter team. And it's like um, he's presenting it in a way it looks like magic for people who are uh, not familiar with concepts and like you know um, with the live demonstration of something where he says here are live tweets they're just popping up and whenever somebody bashes um, we will see it during the con uh, during the uh, the talk and I'm tweeting like iPhone is shit and I have never seen my tweet on the screen and the presentation has been running there. But anyway, <laughs> um, so it's Houdini magic. Some, some a little bit skeptic about this because the guy also said that they are doing this NLP stuff, you know, and they have patents in, in natural language processing for many, many years, so I didn't ever hear any of these names he mentioned. And I did some NLP earlier. Um, so just kind of don't believe it. So it smells like it's a, it's a small solution. It, probably it's not something that you would sell for millions of dollars. It's like a bunch of cues and pipes and filters. Uh, typical concepts how you would process this uh, sort of data. And it looks like natural language processing where you just need to do some to run some analytics on text and, and find out if somebody is bashing or not. It's not that simple for the machine, but still it's doable. So it goes into the direction of mathematics and uh, it's like basic machine learning. Uh, does anybody of you do machine learning for a living? Cool. So I'm at the, at the conference and I have two nights in the hotel. Um, 
I just think I can think of this, like, will work similar. Probably I will not have this awesome, amazing tweets popping up there. Oh, I'm sorry. And, uh, but I can think of something like that. So what I've tinkered, I hope it works because today morning it didn't. I um, have a small press here, so a small demonstration. Um, so actually, I will explain while it's running there what it actually does. Um, I have I've cheated here for the presentation. I have a flat file where I've collected like one and a half millions of tweets and I'm reading them sequentially. And uh, on this side you see that some of them are being processed and uh, there is a recognition of uh, relevant, relevant products or relevant vendors. And some tweets would go to the Twitter team uh, informing them that something is happening there because, t because typically Twitter teams are uh, people who are just watching at the tweets, at social media information. Um, they only react when they say that this is actually rant or is it, it's bashing, whatever. Um, this one doesn't work. This is pretty cool. <laughs> um. No, it doesn't. Okay. No, it does. And I will explain the whole technology because it's also it's it's the the most interesting part of it. Um, so it runs on one and a half million tweets stored in the React system using D Disco, and it recognizes like something like probably 2,000, which are relevant, and it does just negative, positive aggregation there. Okay, so let 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 it run. So the use cases here are two. Um, the first one is, um, well, I need to suck this data, and I need to quickly see what is relevant. Like, what is Samsung or iPhone, whatever vendor or product relevant, so I can inform the Twitter team. It's like just streaming the data. And the other one is collecting and aggregating. For example, you want to, to separate those two when you, um, first you want to inform somebody about what is happening, and the second one, once in a month, you will just uh, check out if your product is performing well uh, according to social media, to social networks. Um, so I did it. Twitter is actually the platform for, it's perfect for me because I say things before I think. Um, but I'm not alone there. And um, so just, you just read this stuff straight from the firehose. Actually, you have, not you have no access to the firehose, to the Twitter firehose anymore, but still you can, you can read feeds, you can get uh, you can just aggregate blocks and stuff like that. Um, so then you fork for notification and batch analytics. I know some guys in this room will not agree with me that it's necessary to do batch analytics, but <laughs> anyway, once in a month, you would do some batch analytics based on what you have stored there. And the bubbles are, um, so feeds come in, I queue them, I filter them according to some criteria. Then I do this fork and I have alerts immediate alerts. Then I also queue for formalization and for store, storing in React. Then afterwards, one in a month, whatever, I would do my analytics and I, I'm, again, I'm queuing this. I will explain the whole tech, why I'm doing this in a way I'm doing this. And I do some MapReduce and I put sentiment analysis and, and uh, do aggregates and reports and, and somebody will have to react. So this is basically the thing and what is the tech? Because it's tech match, so I need to talk about the technology, which is the most interesting part for me. So I use two languages, uh, 
This one has not been mentioned in this conference, as far as I remember, not a single time. Um, also, I'm an Erling guy, so I mean, it explains why I wrote this little 550 pages book. Um, so, that this Twitter part is done with a small library called Tweepiant. I also checked out a couple of crawlers and just uh, uh, using HTML clients for, for sucking uh, blog data. Um, queuing, I'm doing queuing rabbit in queue through Picas, so I'm considering to replace it with zero. Uh, because it's smaller, it's, uh, um, it's light, more lightweight. I store everything in React through Protobuf. Well, this is, this is actually how the, the, the Python uh, library does this. Um, I think you can also go through HTTP, but I don't use this. And MapReduce is done on, the mo on, on a special modified version of Disco. Have you ever heard of Disco Framework? Okay. So I digged into the code of Disco pretty deep into, uh, in order to teach Disco speak to React in a special way, in a data local way. So I don't, I don't have to, you know, to split data, I don't have to trans, uh, transfer huge amounts of data. I'm just running Disco workers on the same nodes React is running on. And I, I, I just take the, the V node local data um, on those nodes and I process it. So that's basically it. Um, some math. Analytics is NLP with NLTK. Ever heard of NLTK? Okay, it's a real cool thing to do um, um, natural language processing in Python with lots of experience of very experienced guys for many, many years now. Um, I, do, I use NLTK trainer to, to um, well, actually to pickle. Um, the, 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 the training set, and, and I, I never update my algorithm, so once I trained it, I, I'm reusing it all the time. Um, the algorith or algorithms I'm doing here, naive bias to, um, well, to decide if it's a rent or not rent, decision tree to do filtering, binary classification based on trigram frequencies just to recognize the language. Um, and um, simple name and antibot filtering based on uh, public and also own copper. I will dig into it just in a minute. Okay. So, some numbers. Because numbers are sexy, right? I mean, it needs to be big data. It's not a small data. Um, it's not a medium data. It's like, you need to compare things. Um, so, in my opinion is when, when numbers become se too sexy for you. You know this guy, right? I'm too sexy for my cat. Yeah. So, so it, it, it's just, it just becomes porn. So um, I'm absolutely not into this numbers porn. It's uh, you, your numbers, how fast you are, how much you can process, just need to satisfy what you try to solve, not more than that. Because if you do more than that, I mean, I, I've heard of, of companies preparing platforms to accept like 800 millions of connections per second in parallel, simultaneously but having only 800 users at all. So, I mean, it's overdoing. This is bullshit. But it's cool to impress people with numbers. My numbers are not that impressive as uh, those of one guy in the audience who will speak later in this track. But anyway, the numbers are on my MBA. That's actually where I've just uh, experimented with it. I can take from different feeds, including Twitter, because from Twitter you don't get that much from the public stream. Um, it's like 10,000 chaotic messages per minute, it's uh, an estimation here. Um, I can do, I can store formalized, I do some formalization on a React uh, cluster with uh, three nodes and uh, uh, based on quorum, right, is based on quorum. Um, so I'm doing analytics on around about 7,000 messages per, se per minute. Um, I just filter, I just do post-negative, positive-negative aggregation and some location-based aggregation, so it's not in the demo. It's a little bit heavier there and it's not that reliable. Um, uh, in the demonstration, uh, it's roughly one and a half million tweets uh, that I'm processing and doing this positive-negative uh, aggregation 
just stream processing in seven minutes. So MapReduce in 15 seconds on, on this amount of data because I've just prepared it. It's already in the store, you know. Um, actually, if it's still running, it should do some further magic here. But probably it just finished running. This is what I expect. Oh, yeah, it did. That's no good. Um, I can let it run again. So I, I tried to, I cheated a little. This is the third night, actually, in, in a different hotel <laughs> to play with maps and, and how I can uh, do this uh, location uh, demonstration. So I just didn't believe this guy because I know about the location uh, problems and, and coordinates missing in tweets. I will explain this a little bit later. So that, that I'm not cheating, I'm going through um, the web uh, stomp interface of Rabbit and just, you know, just uh, take my stuff from, uh, straight from the queue. Well, also not impressive. So some lessons learned. Uh, this is the most important thing. I mean, I'm, I, I love to experiment with things. I love, love to learn new things. So um, let me explain a couple of things here. What I've experienced from Twitter is that when you, when you suck from the public stream, you will, you will get fluted by the believers. You know the believers? Justin Bieber lovers. Ha, actually, I think that the only reason for Twitter to exist is to provide this stuff, or probably for the public stream. It's actually being filled with believers stuff. You will not get anything uh, reasonable out of it. Um, so six, r around about 60% of what I've experienced was completely useless garbage. But when you go into this analytics part, let's consider th some things. You know, everybody knows this dude, right? So the real name is DHH, as well as the username. I mean, we know who it is. How would machine know who it is? Can the machine decide if it's a human or it's a boat or whatever? No chance. Um, so it's talking about filtering. What would I filter for? because bots ranting around are probably not useful. The other thing is abs absurd profile bias. Do you know James Golick? He's awesome, really. I met him in Vancouver. He's a real good packer. I have deep respect for him. But what he says on his Twitter is this, on his Twitter profile. So when I try to, to filter for four language, I mean, I will get rid of James Golick, and I would love to hear his opinion about the iPhone, you know. So the other thing is, uh, Zvi is a guy well known in the Erling community, he's from Israel. The story behind this one is, uh, I met him in San Francisco, and as we tweeted around, I just recognized that uh, his tweets are still coming from San Francisco, so he's now for months back, in, back to Israel. Like, dude, did you move to San Francisco again? No, I'm here in Tel Aviv. Like, huh? So uh, you cannot even trust in this information there. My own profile on Twitter, it says in the location thing, it says just uh, Senor Rubber Dog. Uh, it's a long story why I'm writing this, but anyway, it's my location. Is there a location called Senor Rubber Duck somewhere on Earth? I don't believe it. Let's look at the language. Google is a pretty cool thing. I, in order to get to, to have this example here, uh, I had to tinker around on, on Google. But this is just a demonstration. I mean, uh, Google does an awesome job in, in language recognition. But when you write something like this, Wood Knight, I mean, it's lead. And what it says, it's German. Well, actually, based on my location. So, uh, <laughs> both things are unreliable. I had bigger problems with language recognition using an LTK, so I'm going for these trigrams there. Um, and what I've learned, it was half a night, actually, to find out that Spanish is anti-class for everything. It will take, like, you know, uh, statistically, it will take everything from Arabian languages, Japanese, and whatever. And I can say, what is not English and German, it's Spanish. 
Okay, so I can I can filter this. I have no idea why this happened, but it, it's a lot of tinkering. So let's talk about Disco. Disco is a real cool thing. I will do more and more with this framework. So what it actually does is, the distribution is Erlang based, which is, from my opinion, these days just the most reliable platform for distribution, uh, where you just get the distribution for free, and you run. Uh, Python jobs, um, mappers, uh, reducers, and so on. Uh, the way you run it on Hadoop as well, it's Hadoop streaming is just like opening the standard input output and just streaming around. And um, you can actually re implement part of Disco, change some part of Disco because it's hard coded to run something else but, uh, than Python. So you can call Java uh, uh, processes there. So it's uh, extending Disco. A, a good system is well. It's hard to extend. Uh, it's uh, it's hard to change in the core, but it's good. It's it's good for change uh, for extensions, you know. So it's actually good. But I had to dig real deep into the platform, and to modify very many spots in the code, just to teach this thing not to fire up new nodes, slave nodes, just to accept those who are running. Because I don't want my React nodes. To you know, to get started by Disco, this is this is probably a live system. Um, so, the other point was this streaming, this this standard input output stream. What you do with React? Do you have any experience with React here? Okay. So when you when you, I mean, this the most stupid thing to ask a key value store is just give me all keys, right? A distributed, it's impossible. Because I mean, you will get like probably 80 percent if something goes wrong, and um, so. But anyway, here I have to to suck from the V nodes, from the virtual nodes there. So it doesn't fit well how Disco communicates, the Erlang part communicates with Python through the standard input output there, and how you accept keys from React from. Um, on the low level, because you will get flooded. Your process or processes will get flooded with messages, and it will, it will start throttling and complaining around when you're not fast enough taking out these messages. So it doesn't fit well. So on the flight back from Tallinn, I'm sitting uh, close to Dan North, and he's just saying, hey, why aren't you using a queue there? So I, I looked at, uh, at the code there, and the extension was like done in five minutes. Because this is a part where Disco was real great to extend. And I have it up on GitHub. Um, and exactly, and uh, somebody from, from the Disco team has emailed me. So we probably will use it later. Um, talking about languages, I, ha I had to learn yesterday that Tech Mesh is, uh, well, is aiming for functional languages, or it's a functional languages conference, whatever. So um, just go try coding on the same project, same time, Erlang and Python. I mean, <laughs> they are a little bit different. <laughs> so this punctuation thing, I mean, I'm, I'm running in this hell on the, all the time. It just doesn't compile. I mean, why the hell doesn't it compile? Oh, yeah, it wasn't Python. It was Erlang. Um, what I'm terribly missing is one of those things I love about Erlang is language, and the language is really simple, but this is pattern matching. I mean, I don't want to miss the pattern matching in any single language anymore, really, since I know this. You know about this one, right? Everybody? Cool. Um, I just love it. And from the technical perspective or a runtime perspective, I, I, I need to consider probably running Python and Erlang embeddedly, but this will be pain in the ass, I'm pretty sure, because it, it will hide behind a NIF, and when something happens, I will probably just kill the, the React node, which is not that good. Um, let's briefly talk about sentiment analysis. Do you know what sentiment anal uh, analysis is? So, well, actually, in this case, it's a strong sentiment analysis, uh, because people have to rent or you have to check if people are renting. So human na nature and, and tweets coming from this are, well, a little bit unpredictable for the machine. I mean, just look at this tweet here. Everybody can read it, right? 
Would you say it's positive or negative? I mean, forget things like sarcasm, right? I mean, it can be sarcastic as well, so it gets a new dimension. But I have no idea if it's positive or negative, really. In my world, it would be real sarcastic. It's like, Arr! snow again. Um, so anyway, the machine doesn't have a chance. No, it doesn't have a chance to, to, to deal with something like that. So you get with NLTK, you get a corpus, a, corpus, a couple of corpora, and the, the corpus you use for sentiment anal, uh, anal, analysis and in order to, to train your naive bias algorithm is called movie reviews. It's a little bit filtered, but still it's like they swear around there and stuff. So you can have negative and positive information there. But it's not big enough. So what I actually had to do is I, had, I have extended it with some further information. Uh, everybody knows Linus Torvalds. He's, he's one of the world changers. I love him, really. But he's, he has strong, strong opinion, right? And he's, well, he's not picky about word, words he's using. So you actually can, when you have a title like this, you can expect that this is pretty negative. So I think that this one was a, a fake, but anyway. Uh, do you know this one? Ever heard of Mr. Zed Shaw? So Zed is also an impressive hacker, and he has a much stronger opinion in how he expresses himself. I mean, he's not the most popular person in the Erlang community, probably. But uh, anyway, programmers need to learn statistics or I will kill them all. And the whole text is going on like that, you know on and on and on. So you can, what I did, I just took his whole block and said, it's everything is negative there. It's okay. I mean, I don't care about uh, that, the fact that I absolutely agree with what he's saying here, really. But <laughs> it's the way to express yourself, right? So it's, it, it was fine for teaching my algorithm. Um, so frequently asked questions. Uh, I did this talk a couple of times and, and to just have some questions here just uh, to prevent that you ask the same questions again. So wh why the heck am I doing this? This is the first question. Okay, it's because I can. Um, nice argument, right? <laughs> it's because I want. This is the most important uh, argument for me. I want to learn. I want to, to go deep on, uh, on low level. I, wa I want to, to understand in depth how frameworks can interact together, how libraries, how our single products can, can be brought together in a way that it's absolutely optimal concerning the machine. Um, and combining computer science with math is the most impressive thing you can ever do. You, will, you can only learn, really. Or in my case, I'm relearning things I forgot earlier. As I, uh, I mean, during this phase of my life, I was more after chicks and beer than after math. So. I kind of regret it right now and have to relearn these things. Um, anyway, why not just use Hadoop? Um, I didn't want to run this on the JVM, to be honest. And I have two use cases, and this is probably the biggest misunderstanding in this uh, Hadoop hype, in this Hadoop uh, world. It's like you use Hadoop for batch processing. This is what it's for. You don't use it for near real-time analytics. You just don't use it, right? So I have two use cases, and I have to solve two use cases separately. Well, I can reuse my algorithms, of course, but it's not the reusage of the whole stack. The more interesting question is, why did I want to use it uh, to run it on the JVM? Well, technically seen, the big data is real heavily growing on. Um, on the JVM. We have Hadoop, Pig, Hive, Storm, Kafka, Esper, if you go for CEP, uh, similar things here. Mahot for machine learning and open NLP and stuff like that for natural language processing. But um, any Java developers around? Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to have this one on, on my machine. Pro actually, my MBA here is completely Maven free. I'm proud of it. 
the others machines are not so <laughs> really they are kind of uh, infected but uh, well it, it's actually a big data you have half of internet on your machine um, and just to be honest I'm just evaluating a couple of alternatives to the Java ecosystem um, just take it as it is here I hope you know this guy um, why am I queuing it because cases are known where without queues well let's say without queues a gazillions of messages per, per seconds can be done um, well in my case probably I could but I don't I mean I have no trivial statistics here it's language processing it's real heavy and when you go for Python it's getting more heavier there so um, I have to deal with chaotic text I have to filter around so uh, it's it's a uh, you know I also have the situation where um, I'm working with React and I know that there are some um, there is some time where we, you want to protect any data store from getting flooded by writes through queues this is just normal and React isn't different in this case um, so I have this pipes and filters concept which is as, as all this Bavarian forest and um, I'm also mixing technologies I mean the best thing to mix technologies from what I've learned during the past weeks is zero MQ it's awesome it has connectors to everything so you can just glue together whatever you like and I will I will pick I will put it into this stack seriously the rabbit is a little bit too heavy for that but I love rabbit well it's Erling and I know Alvaro and, and guys uh, and um, they're doing a great job there but I, I think I just need something small there um, well actually all the frameworks you can get are doing some sort of queuing or buffering whatever behind the scenes you just don't get it you just probably don't see it um, well actually people in this audience will see this but um, I'm also giving this talk to Java programmers so enterprise Java programmers I'm sorry there's a difference. I mean, Java programmers like Martin Thompson. <laughs> I'm quiet all the time when he's speaking. Um, so why did I use Erlang and Python? Well, reliability and distribution Erlang of the Erlang VM is one of the reasons. Um, I just don't need to reinvent the, the wheel done by Zookeeper and stuff like that. It's like you, you just get it for free with Erlang. Python and Erlang, probably you can lynch me for that, but it's, they are functional enough for me for day-by-day -day usage, really. I mean, Erlang is a non-pure functional language, how you would say it. I mean, it, it has a couple of compromises, the uh, trade-offs like, um, um, I mean, the I.O. is, is not uh, um, side effect free and, and you, you need to take care of, uh, of it but for me it's okay at this point I can do a lot of things with what it offers actually and the way of thinking is the most important thing Python as well is, is also in a way functional enough with with uh, uh, lambdas and stuff but anyway it, it doesn't have pattern matching so um, I, I would just skip it what is interesting about Python I mean it's old enough and it, it's used by, by scientists to implement real hard things it doesn't matter that 80 percent of these things are written in C and Fortran behind Python actually <laughs> but still people are real smart mathematicians doing great job there so I just want to to consume this um, well disco is Python combined with Erlang, React and Rabbit are in this case Erlang, so, so this is the further thing. I don't have so many technologies to switch between. I just have a bunch of them. So isn't Python slow like hell? I actually heard this question. Well, it's not operating at, speed, at the speed of life, uh, light, of course. It's slow at some points. Yes, it's an a interpreted language. Yes, it is uh, dynamic and, s and so on and so forth. But anyway, there is PyPy, and I will evaluate it for this uh, thing. I, I just couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't do what I do with NLTK on PyPy yet. 
it just throws some weird uh, errors. But uh, anyway, those guys working on PyPy, it's a, a different um, well runtime for for uh, Python. It, it's fast like hell in some uh, cases, and they also swear that uh, the NLTK use case works. So I, I probably I just need to wrap my mind. Uh, just don't forget I had like three nights or something. Um, well, MBA is boring. Do you know Garrett Smith? He's at this conference. He's the, he's the guy behind this uh, web scale, MongoDB's web scale video. He's the creator of it. And I love this term. So can I do this? Can I make it web scale? Uh, yes, well, I'm operating on web data. Just let, let's consider some scalability points. Um, I can scale with Rabbit. I can scale queues, I can use exchanges, I can go, I can go, uh, I can distribute this in a cluster. Uh, I can chart the queues, whatever. I can dynamize them. I can scale storage with React, well, because it really scales. Um, the basic concepts are allowing it to scale very far. And I can scale MapReduce supported analytics with Disco React because it's like running workers on, uh, on React nodes. So as many React nodes, as many Disco workers I can run there. Um, I can scale data sources fees. I can scale machines, uh, uh, hardware network, cloud. Well, you, you just name it. Um, what's in the future? I don't have the crystal ball. What, I, what I've started doing is pick late in engine for uh, written in Python because probably I can make a stack out of it. Right now it's a little bit dirty, the code. But anyway, probably I can make a stick, uh, stack out of it and, and I will have to face those guys who are having lots of pick scripts uh, already running on Hadoop. So probably I can just go there and, and, and uh, take over and, and run those scripts on my stack. Um, I will add more data sources to mix a little bit better to understand how data will... Um, you know, how, it, how is the interaction between Twitter, Facebook, and blogs, and, and so on and so forth. Do some more analytics there. Um, uh, I will also do some low-level disco modifications that are necessary. And, and as I said, you, as I told you, somebody has uh, contacted me after I've uh, actually contacted them to offer help. And probably for disco 0.5, my whole changes will go there. there. But I think the zero MQ thing for... Uh, to, 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 uh, to have the queue in between um, the Erlang part and the Python part is the most important thing. So what did we learn about big data here? So it's, big data is all about, all about what followed by how and enabled by the what with. So the tools are just not important at the beginning, just far away. You just need to know what it is. So you gather data. You have to analyze it. And the most important thing is you need to gain useful information. I mean, data that doesn't bring you information is useless. It doesn't help you. So you need to know about things. You need to understand what this data brings. And it's not the matter of size. Like, it can be five bytes. But still, if these five bytes are having information, important information in them, you've won. So probably it's not big data in terms of size. Um, so you will find new ways to gather data, to collect information, uh, to, to derive steps for business improvements if you're into this, uh, strategy planning, soft intelligence and enterprise, lev enterprise level stocking. You know what it is? It's when your medical insurance stocks you on uh, uh, social media and uh, adjusts scoring according to if you tweet about alcohol, cigarettes, stuff like that. I know it's a, well, it's a gray zone, right? But still, <laughs> uh, we all know they do this. So, um, but you can also change the world. I mean, this is the real interesting part. You will not be known after you, you died by helping a, a company X, X, Y, Z, improving business in a way. Those people who are fighting epidemics in Africa using huge amounts of data, movement of people, population and stuff, analytics on that. 
they will be known by that. So this is actually the very interesting thing here. Um, but it's up to you. It's also up to me, and, and um, it's up to everybody. What we do with this, you, you can you can you can analyze video streams on public on public places in order not to just record the fact that somebody has been killed by the other one, but in order to prevent this to happen. So these are things that are real relevant for big amounts of data as well. So we're not building Skynet. Um, even if it's there, it will be boring because it's computers. I mean, they are stupid. They only do what we say them to do. Um, but recommend and decision support systems. This is the most important thing. When, I mean, people are not able to make decisions based on millions of features, based on millions of factors. When the machine will help them make the decision based on three selection, or on pre-selected three options, this is the most interesting part. So I expect and I think that this will go into the direction of recommend and decision support systems where people will just pick one and say, hey, yes, this is it. And you name it what you can use it for. Um, and it's not about numbers. It's uh, the, the numbers you have, have to carry your solution. Not more, not less than that. But what's interesting for you and for me it's a huge field for experiments. You can play with things. Lots of libraries are around, lots of technologies. I'm not biased about technologies. I'm, I'm using what comes and what makes sense. In this case, I just use this for reasons I could explain you. Tomorrow I will go for, for, for a storm running on the JVM. I don't, I don't really care. But you can play with things. You can learn a lot. And you can build tool chains. And you dig in deep into math. Oh, yeah. Okay. Actually, it ran. Um, yeah, it's finished again. So it took like a couple of minutes to, to process this stuff. And um, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so before, before you ask me questions, I have a questions for those two German guys, or German-speaking guys. You and you, right? Uh, was ist der Name der Firma, für die ich arbeite? Die, der Name der Firma, für die ich arbeite, heißt? Uh, ich arbeite für uh, Soundcloud. Soundcloud, Berlin. Cassandra? No, ich. Ja. Yeah. Okay. How about you? Code centric. Okay, it's got a book. I'm sorry. <laughs> so here you go. Awesome. So we can have questions now. We can use the panel afterwards. We will have the small panel with a couple of other guys who are uh, deep into this topic as well. So you decide. I have one yeah. question. It's just a technical question, and that's about, could you describe Disco a little bit? It's, it's a Python framework for, Map, uh, for MapReduce, is that right, or is it a, more of an Erlang? Well, the distribution part is written in Erlang, and the Python part is like web and all that stuff, and the coordination and, and, and um, you know, split and, and so on and so forth, and you write uh, um, adapters for, for different data sources also in Python there. Um, so, um, and it's hard-coded how it calls Python workers, actually, how it calls maps there. So it will be a little bit of work to extract this part, to abstract this part away, and, and to allow different technologies there. So the first step I did was, was enabling Erlang code being called as a worker, actually. So this was the first step. There. And it's, it's very Python agnostic, so, um, or Python, um, it, it, it wants to have Python, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, that whole distribution part is um, uh, written in Erlang. And this is the, the good thing, because those guys have some interesting thoughts in the, in the code. So you need to, to read the code to, to come with me here. OK.
You said about uh, Hadoop that it's good for batch processing but not for real-time processing. Uh, what makes Disco better for real-time processing? I don't use Disco for real-time processing as well. Uh, no, um, the real-time processing part is done by a Python script, which is just taking uh, messages from the queue. Does some work and this does notification. That's basically it. Probably I didn't explain this part, but uh, this this was on the. Um, this is actually the processor here doing both. Here, uh, the processor uh, takes the stream and splits the stream into two parts for immediate notification and for storage in React. And the storage in React is behind the scenes, and then I can do this analytical part on the React uh, nodes. And this one is just an example how I can alert. I, I will just send links to the Twitter team as emails, maybe 100 tweets um, in one email. So they just can click and say, OK, yeah, it hurts. So let's talk to this guy. They need to process it. They need to do something with it. Typically, when you, when you rant about something, and I'm ranting all the time about airlines, right? So somebody tweets me back and says, hey, come on, can we help? And I'm like, no, you can't help. I like, I'm having a delay of 10 hours. How can you help me? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Why do you use uh, React and not DDFS? Um, interesting question. Um, I just wanted to. <laughs> well, um, DDFS has also this disco DB, right? It's like a, so it's on top of it. So you can use it as a database as well. But um, actually, I also had to combine this experiment with digging deeper into how React works on the low level. So the idea was to ask vNodes for data. And having this in mind as well, I just combined it here too. Also, uh, it, it's not only about React, but it, it's, I think it's interesting for Disco in the future to be able to run workers on pre-running nodes. It wasn't possible to do so. It just wanted to, to fire up slaves and that's it. So this is actually the important part, part here, the interesting part. If it's React behind the scenes, it doesn't matter because what happens is that I call an Erlang function. I, I just expect the node to be here. I can configure it and so on and so forth, the way you do configuration for, for, for Disco nodes. But it's not being started, it's expected to be here. And I can call an Erlang function there. And this Erlang function does nothing more than just uh, uh, sucking from, from vNodes on React, this one. The other example just uh, delivers raw, just returns raw uh, with a string in the, in the URL. So it, you can do anything with that, you know? It's, it's really not about React. It's like side projects of the side project of a side project. Exactly, because technically it's not necessary to do it like that. No, absolutely not. Probably overdid a little. <laughs> but again, experiment. I know this is sort of a, a um, your own experiments on a, on a small scale, but as an academic exercise, you looked at um, tweaking your sample or master data size to adjust, see if that affects the classifier performance. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question because I think the microphone is not on. So. Is that working? Probably, yep. yeah. Okay. Um, as an academic exercise, yeah. have you looked at what affects performance of the classifier on a per message basis? Well, um, probably you, you saw that I'm doing this, um, I'm using the NLTK trainer and it's with pickle true. So it means that uh, I don't have to train all the time algorithm, just, it, it just prepares data structures and reuses them. Um, so actually the classification part, in this case for tweets, it's not that slow. What is slow is processing blocks. Because you have to break down in paragraphs, and in, in, in sentences, and have to decide afterwards, what, is this really negative or positive or kind of, you know? Um, and I didn't really analyze what is, uh, what, what's about the performance of the, of the classification uh, being done with NLTK. 
I just didn't have to do it because it just ran. It's, it was fast enough for this case. But when it's not fast enough, uh, I have to. I, I can probably try to use PyPy for, you know, for the Python side, where it can get uh, faster. And generally, the the algorithm itself. I mean, it's native bias. It's trained native bias. It's not that fat, really, in this case. Did I answer the question, the question in a way? OK, thank you. Uh, which parts of the Hadoop ecosystem do you miss when using Disco? Which part I'm missing? Yeah. When I use this? Yeah. That was peak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that Pig and Hive are the reason why it's getting that popular, actually, because you can reach people who are not technicians. You don't want to write these jobs in Python, even if scientists can. Python is probably more accessible for them than Java. But, I mean, what are Pig scripts? Pig scripts are still, like, basic language, and you, at some point you will always have to call a custom function there. And um, somebody has to implement this, of course. But anyway, it, it makes it popular. So if I, if I go on with this experiment, making a, a, a clean stack out of it as an alternative, I will sure provide the whole PIC implementation in the first step. This is the part I'm missing, really. Yeah. Because it's for acceptance outside, right? Any other questions? Should we get ourselves some tea, coffee, and then go to the panel? Okay, thank you very much again.